Thank you for tuning into the Spooky Scary Show, where two friends in two different states discuss all things spooky, creepy, and just downright strange. This is Pinky here. <laughs> and I'm Dolly. Welcome to the weirdest episode to date. It's not really spooky scary, more creepy and slimy. Why? Pinky, why don't you tell us what this week's topic is about? This topic is my jam. I love science and famous scientists and anything lab related or experiments gone wrong. Mad scientists. <laughs> yep. As more of the scientific thinker, if that is the right term, um, Pinky has always been the smartest person in school. She definitely helped me um, you know, pass all my science classes and everything. So this theme, we will be, the overarching theme is just mad scientists. So we just definitely went down the whole like rabbit hole. Um, that when I was going through this whole scientist thing, I found some things I regret stumbling upon. I'm pretty sure Pinky found some weird stuff as well. <laughs> Definitely. So I was looking into like a lot of the weird World War II medical experiments and stuff that went on, and that stuff's just a little too dark for my taste. I can't deal with animals and animal harm. Same. Yeah, no, I definitely, I think we fell upon the same scientist back in World War II days. Anything to do with, like, dogs or just animals in general is just really inhumane. So I think the topics we chose um, are really, like, safe from that aspect. So it should be good for the most part, I think. Mine are fun. <laughs> It's funny because, like, I avoided animal death, but there is human death in my stories. But uh, that doesn't bother me. Just the animals. As long as no dogs are harmed. For you know. real. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay. So, with that being said, I'm going... I have two topics. As usual, the first one is not as long as the second one. This one I titled Silly Mad Scientists. Um, so this story is about Stubbins Firth. He was born in 1784 and died in 1820. He was the first American trainee doctor, most notable for his unusual investigations and his obsession with the yellow fever. So just to kind of give you a little bit uh, insight about the yellow fever, this illness ranges from a fever with aches and pains to severe liver disease with bleeding and jaundice or yellowing of the skin. Most people will not have symptoms, but if you are unlucky enough, some people will develop yellow fever illness with initial symptoms including Sudden, did you say something? No. Oh, sound like a weird like glitch happened. I've been getting it on your end too. Like when you talk, it's like this deep voice in your voice. It's really weird. Ew, don't say that. That's creepy. It's strange. I don't know. Ew, it literally sounded like you're like, yep. Or like you're going to like say something. No. Okay. Well, I'm not going to get weird, but I'm just going to say those of the white light are only welcomed in my space. If you're not of the white light, please leave me right now. Okay. I'm just trying to record. Oh, right. I'm leaving that in there. <laughs> you should do it. That was weird. Spooky scary. Uh -huh. That is very spooky scary. Please, ghosty. I'm trying to do something right now. All right, back to the yellow fever. <laughs> Most people will not have symptoms, but if you are unlucky enough to have symptoms, this is what you 
can have. Sudden onset of fever, chill, severe headache, back pain, general body aches, nausea, vomiting, fatigue, weakness. Most people with initial symptoms improve within one week. For some people who recover, weakness and fatigue might last several months. A few people will develop a more severe form of the disease. Uh, for one out of seven people who have the initial symptoms, there will be a brief remission that may only last a few hours or for a day, followed by a more severe form of the disease. So basically, if you're diagnosed and you feel like, I'm getting so much better, I feel fine, I can go for a walk, chances are the next day you will feel even worse. That sucks. So, yeah, it sounds pretty intense. And the severe symptoms include high fever, yellowing of the skin or jaundice, bleeding, shock, organ failure, or even death. Among those who develop severe cases, 30 to 60% of them actually die. So let's hope if you were to contract this, it would just be mild, not severe, because your chances of survival are not that great. There is no medicine or treatment to cure the infection from yellow fever. Your best bet is to rest, drink fluids, and to use pain relievers to reduce fever and to relieve the aching. So that's the overview of the yellow fever symptoms. So let's go back to Stebbins. Stebbins joined the University of Pennsylvania where he studied the disease that had so significantly impacted the area. He noted that the disease was far more widespread during the summer months and the number of yellow fever cases dropped significantly during the winter. So he waited until the next outbreak in 1802 that lasted until 1803 to prove that this was not a contagious disease and was so sure of his theory that he began performing experiments on himself. What? Are you ready for this, Pinky? No. This is where it gets nasty, girl. Stubbins decided to bring himself into direct contact with bodily fluids from those that had became infected. What the French toast? He started to make incisions on his arms and smeared vomit into the cuts, then proceeded to pour it into his eyeballs. Good lord. Oh, it gets better. He continued to try to infect himself using infected vomit by frying it and inhaling the fumes. Vomit omelet. Vomit omelet. Hell yes. Uh. And when he did not become ill, he drank it undiluted. <laughs> Oh, it keeps going. Endeavoring to prove that other body fluids yielded the same results, Stebbins progressed on from the vomit and would go on to smear his body in blood, saliva, and urine. It's terrible. He was trying so desperately to prove that it's not contagious, it's a seasonal thing, so he's like, look, everybody, I'm doing all these things and I'm not being infected. Huffing vomit omelets and ugh. frying it. Like, if I smell vomit, immediately it, it's, it's done. It's over. It's coming out. I cannot Same. imagine frying it. That's like a biological response to not, uh -huh. to not get sick. We want to avoid it for a reason. Yeah. Anyway. Oh, man, I'm drinking a lot of wine for this one. <laughs> <laughs> he, 
he still managed to avoid contracting the disease and saw this as proof for his hypotheses. However, it was later shown that the samples Stubbins had used for his experiments came from late-stage patients who were no longer contagious. So it wasn't even... It wasn't even worth it! Fucking slicing your skin open, frying vomit, smearing yourself in blood and urine in late-stage patients. Disgusting. That's ridiculous. Nasty. Yellow fever is actually highly contagious and is spread by mosquito bites. This, however, was proven by Carlos Finlay, a Cuban scientist, 60 years after the death of Stubbins. Ugh. All for naught, maybe? Oh, man. <laughs> so that one was more of like my silly kind of funny one. Because it's really kind of gross. Silly funny. That that was spooky scarier than... No, I'm done. We're done here. <laughs> Biggie's like, I can't. <laughs> no. Oh, I love it. And then, so my next topic is of the amazing Nikola Tesla. Y yeah. So, Everybody knows his name, but do we, like, really know Nikola Tesla? I mean, <laughs> maybe. Are you going to learn me some knowledge? I'm going to learn you. And my disclaimer for all you listeners is I have had a lot of wine, so bear with me, because I'm a little drunky pants. means Pinky has to do a lot of editing tomorrow. <laughs> No, how rude. F's in the chat for Pinky. F's in the chat right now, boys. <laughs> so, Nikola Tesla was truly a man who was ahead of his time. This segment, I'm going to just relay a brief background information and then share uh, fun facts about him. So, Nikola Tesla was born on July 10th, 1856. He was raised in the Austrian Empire, where he received a advanced education in engineering and physics in the 1870s, and he gained experience in the early 1880s working in telephony and in new electric power industry. He immigrated to the U.S. in 1884, where he became a neutralized citizen. His career quickly took off, earning him a considerable amount of money. Tesla conducted a range of experiments with medical oscillators and generators, electrical discharge tubes, and early x-ray imaging. He also built a wireless controlled boat, one of the first ever exhibited. Tesla became well known as a inventor and would demonstrate his achievements to celebrities and wealthy patreons at his lab and was noted for his showmanship at public lectures. Tesla experimented with a series of inventions in the 1910s and 1920s with varying degrees of success. Having spent most of his money, Tesla lived in a series of New York hotels, leaving behind unpaid bills and a lot of debt that he happened to owe towards J.P. Morgan Chase and other people. But he died in New York City in 1943, uh, where he was like 83 years old. Tesla's work fell into relatively obscurity following his death until 1960. So that is a little background information. Um, and then these are the top fun facts that I found about him. Number one. <laughs> I thought this one was kind of funny. So, he shook the poop out of Mark Twain. Literally? Literally shook the shit out of him. <laughs> I love it. Go on. Uh, one famous legend surrounding the eccentric 
Tesla was that he had a earthquake machine in Manhattan laboratory that shook his building and nearly brought the neighborhood down during experiments. However, it didn't bring the block to ruins, but it did shake the poop out of Mark Twain. Twain was known for having digestive problems, so Tesla, who knew Twain through their gentleman's club, invited him over. He instructed Twain to stand on the platform while he flipped on the osculator. After about 90 seconds, Twain jumped off the platform and ran for the facility. That's funny. <laughs> he really had to go poo-poo after that one, I guess. Number two. Tesla had insomnia and, as everybody might know, a obsessive-compulsive behavior. And he was also obsessed with the number three. It was said before entering any building, he had to walk around the building three times before actually entering the building. Nikola Tesla said that he once worked for 84 hours straight without any rest. I mean... That's crazy. I'm exhausted after 40 hours. I can't imagine 84 hours straight. Yeah, that's crazy. Well, with my other facts, I, I would believe he would be able to pull off 84 hours straight. Like he didn't sleep or go take a break? or There's no, there's no way. Physically, I think you would probably work yourself to death, but... As we go down, there's another fact where it says he only sleeps for two hours a night. So maybe that would have something to do with like 84 hours a week. But that's like, I don't know, man. But that's what the inventor said. It's pretty insane. He could have been a little cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. But I love him. Number four, pearls drove him crazy. Tesla could not stand the sight of pearls to the extent that he refused to speak to any woman wearing them. When his secretary wore pearl jewelry, he sent her home for the day. No one knows why he had such a distaste, but Tesla had a very particular sense of style and aesthetics. He believed that in order to be successful, one needed to look successful. Hashtag any entrepreneur out there in 2019 slash 2020. He wore white gloves to every dinner party and prided himself on being a dapper dresser. So kind of elaborating on that, every photograph of Tesla, he said, is very carefully constructed to capture his air quote, good side kind of like social media now but back then Literally. yeah i can only imagine how long it took that photographer to like get that perfect shot of him and number five he had a photographic memory and fear of germs he was known to memorize books and images and stockpile visions for inventions in his head he also had a powerful imagination and the ability to visualize in three dimensions, which he used to control the terrifying, vivid nightmares he suffered from as a child. He was also known for having excessive hygiene habits, born out of a near-fatal bout of cholera as a teenager. Cholera is a bacteria that is found in contaminated water that causes severe diarrhea and at the time Nicholas father was a priest who wanted Tesla to join the church and to pursue priesthood but literally on Tesla's deathbed he said if I am going to survive this I don't want to be a priest I want to be an engineer and his father actually agreed which I think is his only saving grace to how he was actually able to pursue science over becoming a priest, which is kind of crazy. To boost his brain power, Tesla performed toe exercises. He used to squish his toes each 100 times every night to stimulate his brain cells. Man, maybe I need to do some toe exercises. 
Hell yeah, fam. Got a toe. Got a foot fetish. Toe up. <laughs> toe up, honey. Toe up from the flow up. <laughs> okay, this next fact is my favorite, and I hope you're ready for it. Tesla had a strange relationship with pigeons. The bird? <laughs> yes, with the birds. Later in life, Tesla developed a intense fondness for pigeons that would frequently feed at the park. In fact, after he grew too ill to feed them for himself, he hired others to do it for him. He would even bring sick or injured pigeons back to the hotel where he lived and nurse them back to health. He grew especially fond of one little bird and said this about her, and I quote, I love that pigeon as much as man loves woman, and she loved me. As long as I had her, there was purpose in my life. That's so wholesome. He loved a pigeon. This is spooky scary show, not wholesome content show. I know. I mean, I guess it kind of makes sense because this next fact, he was voluntarily chased. Tesla avoided romance and never married instead of only having platonic relationships with women. He often expressed his belief that romantic relationships limited his ability to invent, even saying, and I quote, I do not think you can name many great inventions that have been made by married men, end quotes. Interesting. Mm-hmm. So even though he didn't believe in, you know, women, well, not that he didn't believe in women, but like marrying women or like following relationships, he also believed that women would become superior to men in the future. Hell yeah, B. I knew I liked this guy. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, son. Bow, 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 bow. <laughs> <laughs> In a 1926 interview, Tesla explained that women would one day reign superior over men, and this would lead to a society closer to that of a beehive, which he saw as a ideal model. I'm a queen bee bee. That's awesome. Nikola Tesla was also a vegetarian, so... Also, going back to a person being ahead of his time, in his time, everybody was like, you need to drink loads of milk and eat about meat with every single meal every day. Disgusting. Yeah, the government actually, like, pushed it because of, there was, like, a surplus, I think, after World War II. They were just trying to sell it and get rid of it. That's where all the, like, you need milk thing came from. Yeah. Yeah, I even remember, like, um... Well, later learning, like, the pyramid, like, the nutritional pyramid is actually, like, really not good for you. But, like, for one, for I, if I were to eat that much bread, I would probably die, let alone, like, that much, like, meat and everything. Yeah. I think they've updated it more so now. Oh, cool. I should go check that out. You can see, like, what, what your plate should look like. It should be, like, half... Uh, leafy green vegetables and then like a fist portion of healthy grain and a fist portion of meat oh wow protein it doesn't have to be meat protein dang that's crazy that has seriously changed so much so later in his life tesla became a vegetarian cutting meat and eventually fish entirely out of his diet tesla believed that the production of meat was inefficient and unhealthy, and that in the future, food sources would mainly be milk and vegetables. Still kind of gross with the milk, but I see your vegetables. However, he continued to progress with his ideas until he was on a entirely liquid diet, leading to some skeptics to believe that his behavior was his way of rationalizing a eating disorder that he was suffering from. That's pretty and extreme. If actually, yeah, if you actually like look at older pictures of him, he looks hella skinny. 
like really, really skinny hmm. for a guy. Tesla hardly ever slept. He slept for about two hours a night so he could dictate more time to inventing many projects that never saw the light of day, unfortunately. Which brings me to my last fact. He invented many things that have remained classified. Upon his death, most of Tesla's belongings were taken by the Office of Alien Property even though he was a legal citizen of the United States. Some of Tesla's documents and papers still remain classified, and while people have requested items via the Freedom of Information Act, those items are heavily redacted before their release. As a result, people tend to wonder what else Nikola Tesla had up his sleeves, like perhaps a device that would lead to free energy before his death, or even alien technology. Ooh, interesting. I know, I thought that was so fun. I love Nikola Tesla. I mean, he was so like new age for his time, and then there's lots of, you know, skeptical like things that he created alien technology and like all this good stuff hell yeah hell yeah tesla is the god of all hippies that is who every hippie worships and that is the end of my segment all right all right so as long as there's no other spooky scary ghosts coming into my room what you got for me pinky my story is kind of conspiracy theory and science. I'm sure many of you have heard about it before. It's called the Philadelphia Experiment. Nope. It's crazy that you haven't heard of it. <laughs> I know. Well, science isn't really like my thing. Like I'm a weirdo. I like metaphysical kind of science. So this is your jam. Educate me. All right. This is one of the most grotesque military urban legends ever, and it has endured as an infamous World War II conspiracy theory. But is there any truth to it? Let's take a look. Mm -hmm. I'm ready. According to legend, on October 28, 1943, the USS Eldridge, a cannon-class destroyer escort, was conducting top-secret experiments designed to win command of the oceans against the Axis powers. The rumor was that the government was creating technology that would render naval ships invisible to enemy radar. And there in the Philadelphia Naval Shipyard, it was time to test it out. Witnesses claim an eerie green-blue glow surrounded the whole of the ship as her generator spun, and then, suddenly, the Eldridge disappeared. <clears throat> no way. Yeah. The ship was then seen in Norfolk Naval Shipyard in Virginia before disappearing again, and then reappearing back in Philadelphia. I think, um... I think I read that that was like 200 miles distance. Like, there was no way that it could... It's true. It was an actual ship. It kind of explains it a little bit further down. I think I put some something in here about, like, they were doing, like, cloaking magnetic type to hide from the enemy. Uh, there's just some weird stuff here. The legend states that classified military documents reported that the Eldridge crew were affected by the events in disturbing ways. Some went insane. Others developed mysterious mental illness, but others still were said to have been fused together with the ship, still alive, but with limbs sealed to the metal. What? Like radiation? Like they teleported and when they teleported back, they didn't come back whole. They teleported <gasps> into the ship. No. Yeah, that'll, that'll give you nightmares. What the fluff? How have I never heard of this before? <laughs> so another part of the legend of the Philadelphia experiment is the bizarre bar fight during which two of the sailors involved in the experiment suddenly vanished into thin air. <gasps> before we break down what really happened that day, let's talk about the man behind the myth, Carl M. Allen who would go by the pseudonym Carlos Miguel Allende. In 1956, Allende sent a series of letters to Morris K. Jessup, author of the book The Case for the UFO. 
in which he argued that unidentified flying objects merit further study. Jessup apparently included text about unified field theory because this is what Alan Day latched onto for his correspondence. In the 1950s, Unified field theory, which has never been proven, attempted to merge Einstein's general theory of relativity with electromagnetism. In fact, Alan Day claimed to have been taught by Einstein himself and could prove the unified field theory based on events he witnessed on October 28, 1943. Alan Day claimed that he saw the Eldridge disappear from the Philadelphia Naval Yard and he further insisted that the United States military had conducted what he called the Philadelphia Experiment and was trying to cover it up. Mm, girl. I know. Jessup was then contacted by the Navy's Office of Naval Research, who had received a package containing Jessup's book with the annotations claiming that extraterrestrial technology allowed the U.S. government to make breakthroughs in unified field theory. Aliens! Oh, wait, was this before or after um, Roswald? Do you know? Do you know what year Roswald happened? Like 1947. Okay, so this happened October 1943. Oh, snap. Okay, that's even more crazy before you're like, okay, okay, okay. Okay, how'd they get the aliens? We don't know. That's cool. <laughs> okay, <laughs> this is one of the weirdest details. The annotations were designed to look like they were written by three different authors. One, maybe extraterrestrial. According to Val's article for the Journal of Scientific Exploration, Jessup became obsessed with Alan Day's revelations, and the disturbed researcher would take his own life in 1959. It wasn't until 1980 that proof of Alan Day's forgery would be made available. Inexplicably, two ONR officers had 127 copies of the annotated text printed and privately distributed by the military contractor Vero Manufacturing, giving wings to Alan Day's story long after Jessup's death. So everything that happened was dismissed by government agencies and Alan Day was said to have made everything up. I don't know. What do you th what do you think? Science gone wrong cover up or something that can be reasonably explained by science? Definitely want to discredit whoever is involved in whatever you're researching to cover your butt. So that's just kind of that makes them look guilty. The the Navy said so there were like witnesses that were there that were part of the Navy that said that that none of that happened. They were just doing what they called like degassing or degaussing, which it has to do with like magnets, but it basically makes it so your ship is invisible to other ship radars. But I don't know. That's true. I mean, with a lot of the other like extraterrestrial thesis and everything is like the the main reason we want to get to this technology before any other country is to actually introduce being invisible and just like how much power a military force could have if they could actually be invisible sneaking up on people and then bombing them or like whatever extremely dangerous but that is the military's like goal yeah, and the way we sit right now, like, we don't have the propulsion, the, the fuel to get far in space. It's just not possible with the way we do things. We just, yeah. so, like, from other readings, it made it kind of sound like maybe they had uh, extraterrestrial knowledge, whatever, that unified field theory, something that Einstein couldn't prove. Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe they found, like, the key to it or cracked the code to it. I don't know. It, it's just crazy. Definitely. There's something. They're hiding. It's pretty weird to me that he committed suicide, too. Mm-hmm. Air quotes, suicide. Yeah, I think they found, like, him in his car, and it was, like, piped into his, uh, his exhaust was piped into his car. Crazy. Yeah. All right, are you ready for the next one? I'm ready. This one's good. I like it. So what I have for you next is the chilling story of the Demon Corps and the scientist who became its victims by Peter Dockrell. Ooh, can I open the link you sent me? 
yeah, open the link and you'll see the pictures of the core and the burns that the man received. Ooh, okay, okay. Can't wait to find out the demon core. Ooh, okay. Is this anything I need to say, like a little prayer before we get into, or? No. Okay, okay. No actual, like, demons. Possessions no. or nothing. Just science. Okay. Science gone okay. wrong. Oh my god. I'm ready. Oh, sorry. I just saw that burn. <laughs> Ew. Oh my god. Okay. Go. <laughs> it was August 13th, 1945, and the demon core was poised, waiting to be unleashed onto stunned Japan, still reeling in fresh chaos from the deadliest attacks anyone had ever seen. A week earlier, Little Boy had detonated over Hiroshima, followed hmm. swiftly by Fat Man in Nagasaki. These were the first and only nuclear bombs ever used in warfare, claiming as many as 200,000 lives. And if things had turned out a little differently, a third deadly strike would have followed in their hellish wake. But history had other plans. After Nagasaki proved Hiroshima was no fluke, Japan promptly surrendered on August 15th, with Japanese radio broadcasting a recorded speech of Emperor Hirohito conceding to the Allies' demands. As it turns out, this was the first time the Japanese public at large had ever heard one of their emperor's voices. But for scientists at the Los Alamos Laboratory in New Mexico, aka Project Y, the event had a more pressing significance. It meant the functional heart of the third atom bomb that they'd been working on, a 6.2 kilogram, which is 13.7 pounds, sphere of refined plutonium and gallium wouldn't be needed for the war after all. If the conflict had still been raging as it had for almost five straight years, this plutonium core would have been fitted into a second Fat Man assembly and detonated above another unsuspecting Japanese city, just four days later. As it was, fate issued those souls a reprieve, and the Los Alamos device, codenamed Rufus, at this point, would be retained at the facility for further testing. It was during these tests that the leftover nuke, which ultimately became known as the Demon Core, earned that name. The first accident happened less than a week after Japan's surrender, and only two days after the date of the Demon Corps' canceled bombing run. If I could just, like, say how disgusting this burn is. I don't even know if we could, like, share it without it, like, being flagged, but, like, just imagine your entire palm is just gone. And then, like, the surrounding skin around it is extremely pale. Like, it's a black and white picture. But I can only imagine the surrounding skin is just dead on your entire hand. Nasty, huh? It gets it's... it gets worse, too. Like, it's not just a burn. No way! Okay, I'm ready. That mission may have never launched, but the Demon Corps, stranded at Los Alamos, still found an opportunity to kill. The Los Alamos scientists knew well the risks of what they were doing when they conducted criticality experiments, a means of measuring the threshold at which plutonium would become supercritical, the point where a nuclear chain reaction would unleash a blast of deadly radiation. The trick performed by scientists in the Manhattan Project, of which the Los Alamos lab was a part of, was finding how just how far you could go before that dangerous reaction was triggered. Oh my god, it's like Russian roulette. Yeah, but Ooh. plutonium roulette. Oh god. <laughs> <laughs> they even had an informal nickname for the high-risk ex experiments, one which hinted at the perils of what they did. They called it tickling the dragon's tail, knowing that if they had the misfortune to arouse the angry beast, they would be burned. Holy shikes! And, like, another picture of these people is, like, they're hella young, son. They're, like, our age, like, 20-something. Like, this guy has a shirt unbuttoned with sunglasses. He's just chilling. Yeah. Crazy. Yikes. So, this is exactly what happened to Los Alamos physicist Harry Dagelin. 
On the night of August 21st, 1945, Dagolin returned to the lab after dinner to tickle the dragon's tail alone with no other scientists, just a security guard, which was a breach of safety protocols. What a dumbass. Why the fluff would you want to do that alone? I know. Why would you want to do that at all? As Dagolin worked, he surrounded the plutonium spear with bricks made of tungsten carbide, which reflected neutrons shed by the core back at it, edging it closer to criticality. Brick by brick, Dagolin built up these reflective walls around the core until his neuron monitoring equipment indicated the plutonium was about to go super critical if he placed any more. He moved to pull one of the bricks away, but in doing so, accidentally dropped it directly onto the top of the sphere, inducing supercriticality and generating a glow of blue light and a wave of heat. Oh, he did. He just dropped something on the nuclear bomb? Yeah. Oh my god. Daglian reached out immediately and removed the brick, noticing a tingling sensation in his hand as he did so. Why would you reach in there with your bare hand? Yeah, I mean, I'd imagine that it'll blow up. Uh? Nuke the area. Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. Okay, I'm ready. Unfortunately, it was already too late. In that brief instant, he had received a lethal dose of radiation. Mm. His burnt, irradiated hand blistered over and he eventually fell into a coma after weeks of nausea and pain. He was dead just 25 days after the accident. The security guard on duty also received a non-lethal dose of radiation. What? I mean, non-lethal at that moment, probably, but I'm sure he died of... Mesothelioma. Yeah. (laughs) Or something, you know? (laughs) If you've been diagnosed with mesothelioma, you may be entitled to compensation. That's insane. For a brief second, he's like, oh, nope, I need this brick. And it's like, nah, fam, you're dead. That's 25 days later. Like, imagine the torture of, like, just nausea and, like, throwing up. Oh, It would be so awful. If it happened to me, I'd probably just take my own way out, if you know what I mean. Yep, just put me under. That's it. I'm done. Take me out to the pasture. <laughs> But the demon core was not finished. Despite a review of safety procedures after Daglin's death, any changes made weren't enough to prevent a similar accident occurring the following year. Oh my god. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) On May 21st, 1946, one of Daglin's colleagues, physicist Louis Slotin... Come on, Louis. Get it together, Louis. (laughs) He was demonstrating a similar criticality experiment, lowering a beryllium dome over the core. Like the tungsten carbide bricks before it, the beryllium dome reflected neurons back at the core, pushing it towards criticality. Slotin was careful to ensure the dome, called a tamper, never completely covered the core, using a screwdriver to maintain a small gap, acting as a crucial valve to enable enough of the neurons to escape. The method worked until it didn't. Oh god, oh my god, okay. (laughs) (laughs) The screwdriver slipped and the dome dropped for an instant, fully covering the demon core in a beryllium bubble, bouncing too many neurons back at it. Another scientist in the room, Raymer Schreiber, turned around at the sound of the dome dropping, feeling heat and seeing a blue flash as the demon core went supercritical for the second time in the space of a year. This is a quote. The blue flash was clearly visible in the room, although it was well illuminated from the windows and possibly the overhead lights, Schreiber later wrote in a report. The total duration of the flash could not have been more than a few tenths of a second. Slotten reacted very quickly in flipping the tamper piece off. Slotten may have been quick in rectifying his deadly mistake, but again, the damage was already done. Oh no. Oh, you're done for Slotten. Poor Louie. He and seven others in the room, including a photographer and a security guard, were all exposed to a burst of radiation. 
although Slotin was the only one to receive a lethal dose, and a greater one than that that inflicted Daglin. After an initial bout of nausea and vomiting, he at first seemed to recover in the hospital, but within days was losing weight, experiencing abdominal pain, and began showing signs of mental confusion. A press release issued by Los Alamos at the time described his condition as a three-dimensional sunburn. Nine days after the screwdriver slipped, he was gone. The two deadly accidents, only months apart, finally saw real changes take place at Los Alamos. New protocols meant an end to hands-on criticality experiments. Thank God. With scientists forced to use remote control machinery to manipulate radioactive cores at a distance of 100 meters. They also stopped calling the plutonium core Rufus. From then on, it was known only as the Demon Core. Mm, hate that. But after everything that had happened, the leftovers, the leftover nukes time was up too. Following the Slotin accident and the core's resultant increase in radiation levels, plans to use it in Operation Crossroads, the first post-war nuclear ex explosion demonstrations to commerce at the Bikini Atoll a month later, were shelved. Instead, the plutonium was melted down and reintegrated into the U.S. nuclear stockpile to be recast into other cores as necessary. For the second and last time, the Demon Corps was denied its detonation. While the deaths of two scientists can't be compared to the untold horrors if the Demon Corps had been used in a third nuclear attack against Japan, it's also easy to understand why the scientists gave it the superstitious name they did. Then there are the weird details that fill in the backdrop of the story. Like how Daglin and Slaughton weren't just killed by similar accidents involving the same plutonium core. Both incidents took place on Tuesdays, on the 21st day of the month, and the men even passed away in the same hospital room. Of course, those are just coincidences. The demon core wasn't actually demonic. If there's an evil presence here, it's not the core, but the fact that humans rushed to make these terrible weapons in the first place. And the real horror, besides the horrible effects of radiation poisoning, is how spectacularly mid-20th century scientists failed to protect themselves from the extreme dangers they were toying with, despite fully knowing the grave risks in their midst. For real, though. Like, what? Why? Don't know. Don't touch it. What are you doing? <laughs> Put that away. According to Schriebler, Slotin's first words immediately after the screwdriver incident were simple and already resigned. He had comforted his dying friend Daglin in the hospital and he knew what came next. Well, he said, that does it. So his f he, watched, he watched the two people die and that's when he decided that they weren't going to be stupid and keep doing that. Jesus. That's intense. So it's like even more powerful than Hiroshima? Uh I don't I don't think more powerful. Maybe. That's crazy. Like even if it's not more powerful, like ooh, that's insane. The blue flash as the demon core went super critical. And then like you're dead. Sorry about it. It's just like Ah, that's insane. Like, a flash of light can infect your body with, like, that much radiation. You're dead. You're done so. It's crazy. And all all light is radiation. Well, don't even get me started with the whole all light is radiation because my brain <laughs> can't even comprehend that sentence, Pinky. There's just, there's just more harmful forms of radiation than others. Oh, yeah. Okay. I can, I can see that. I'm just googling the demon core, and it just looks like a little metal ball. It's like yeah. the size of a bowling ball. Yeah, and they're touching it, and these guys look so young. Oh, Can so you believe something like that killed 200,000 people? You know, okay, I'm gonna sound crazy, but this is why, if you believe in Jesus or if you believe in aliens, somebody is watching out for the human race to make sure that we're not blowing each other up. 
because we're gonna do something fucking stupid and blow each other the fuck up. I should see if I can find it. Uh, the the bombs that were dropped on Nagasaki in Hiroshima compared to the the bombs that we have now is insane. Have you ever seen like the comparison of the cloud sizes? Not that I can recall. I've seen them like separately, but like not in comparison. Let me see if I can find it and send it to you. Oh, shit. Oh, my God. Hiroshima. Oh, my God. They're so tiny. I know. It's like I didn't even notice Hiroshima in Trinity compared to Mike Bravo in Tsar Bomba Soviet. Insane. Tsar Bomba, the Soviet RDS-202 hydrogen bomb, known by Western nations as Tsar Bomba, was the most powerful nuclear weapon ever created. Terrifying. That's too spooky scary for me. (laughs) Because it's like, you know, everything else is like true too, but like, this is like dooming threat. I don't know. Yeah. And everything that they experienced in that story was true too. And every single one of those people died painful deaths even if they didn't get a lethal right now dose of radiation they still got a dose of radiation that probably led to death and that's crazy and it and like can you just imagine if like there's a brick that fell into the thing and without even thinking you just reach your hand in there to grab it out and then you know, you're you're dead um, not even a month later. It's like grabbing the hot pan out of the oven when it's falling. Yeah. And you're like, God, like why did I do that? Except you're dead. Not just yeah. burned. And that wraps up the Spooky Scary Show. If you wish to stay up to date with us, be sure to follow us on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. If you want to share your experiences of anything ghostly or spooky scary, or to request a topic for us to talk about, email us at spookyscaryshow at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye. Bye. Spooky.